Welcome to the Sri Lankan Understanding, a platform on which we explore the past of Sri Lanka, an island in the Indian Ocean. We look at where the country is at present and we try to understand the potential for the future. Our topic of discussion today is looking at the social aspects of telecommunication in Sri Lanka. To do this, we have a guest who earned his PhD from the University College London. He's a founding council member and lecturer at the Sri Lanka Technological Campus and is head of network strategy and transformation at SLT Mobitel. Thank you very much, Dr. Shamil Apadure, for joining us today on the Sri Lankan understanding. When we look at telecommunication in Sri Lanka, where did this all begin? How did it begin? Thank you, George. That's very interesting. I think if you take the word uh, tele, it comes from the Greek word distant or far away. So if you said telecommunications, where did it begin? You can go as far back as the indigenous people who were using smoke signals and things like that to communicate. However, I think what we are more interested now is when the electrical and electronic aspects of technology came into being what is now known as telecommunications. So the oldest or the first part of that uh, journey began probably in 1838 with the invention of the telegraph system. So there were telegraphs where you would tap using the famous Samuel Morse's Morse code. You would tap your signals in and somebody would collect a message on the other end many kilometers away or thousands of miles away. And that happened in 1938. Uh, separately then Samuel Morse made it really popular with his key code and uh, in 1851, it's very important that this happened, there was a conference between Austria and Germany in Vienna. It said Austria and Germany but it is reliably understood that lots of European companies participated in these countries actually. And what they actually came up with was a standard because when you have communications and particularly over many countries, you can't work in isolation. So this standard, this was the first sort of standards body, if you like, that took place. And they established what telegraph system would be. That was in 1851. Now Sri Lanka were very, very much up to date. By 1858, we had installed our first telegraph circuit between Colombo and Gaul. So just seven years after this standardization process. Then, of course, the well-known Alexander Graham Bell, when he said, Watson, come here, uh, he invented the telephone as we know it. And what he was trying to do was send voice signals down the original telegraph circuit. So what started off for telegrams was the same cables were reused for voice communication. So that was 1878. In 1880, Sri Lanka installed its first telephonic uh, cables. So very much on par with what was happening with the rest of the world. And uh, just as a sort of side, you know, in Sri Lanka, they like electricity. The first light bulb was uh, lit only in 1890 at the Bristol Hotel in Fort. So telecommunications actually precedes electricity in Sri Lanka as well, which is something not a lot of people know about. Then subsequently, Alexander Graham Bell formed his company, Bell Labs, and in 1915, they did what was known as the transcontinental call. So from one end of the US to the other end, uh, they started uh, they started communicating. Uh, Sri Lanka was also you now te telecoms was developing but not so much internationally because these were very cable intensive. You had to lay undersea cables and things like that. And I don't know the exact history of what happened then, but a very Sri Lanka somehow uh, moved to satellite communications in 1976. Now that's also quite seminal because we used wireless communications to make our first international dialing call. So 1976, the satellite station in Padukka was used so that Sri Lanka could connect. So while the rest of the world was connecting with wired, we sort of bypassed that with wireless. And 1976, and of course the big one was in 1989 with the introduction of mobile. Celtel was formed in 1989. And uh, that, that's really where we are now with all that. Uh, just one other thing, so finally Sri Lanka did catch up with uh, the cabling and things. Fiber optics uh, as a communication cabling system was introduced and in 2012 we really started rolling that out quite well. So we are, no, we are very much on par with what's happening with the rest of the world and in many cases we have actually beaten or done better than a lot of our peers in and around this area. It's an amazing journey. I mean when you <coughs> look at what was happening in the 1800s in this country and you mentioned how Telecommunication precedes electricity. Now this is a very interesting fact uh, where we usually um, don't uh, assimilate the two as telecom being or something that we look at from a rather recent understanding. Uh, but as you mentioned, we go back to 
200 years, I mean, with, with the journey that we have taken. 190 at least. 190 yeah. years yeah, where we have taken the, this journey. How was this institutionalized? Now, you mentioned some key milestones in terms of the industry, but in terms of institutions in this country, how was that done? Thank you. That's uh, quite interesting that you use the word institutionalized. It's almost considered a derogatory term at this, in this day and age. But uh, actually, it's right and important that we understand how this was institutionalized in Sri Lanka, telecoms in particular. Um, if you say that our history dates back 175 to nearly 200 years, obviously it started under the British rule. Uh, and at that time, everything came under what was known as the Department of Post, the, the snail mail service de Department of Post. Subsequently, with uh, telegraph and things becoming important, uh, it became the Department of Posts and Telecommunications. Um, there was actually an ordinance, uh, telecommunications ordinance set up in 1944, and there have been subsequent amendments to that ordinance in 1948, 1970, 1974, and 1979. Uh, in one of these amendments, I think uh, it kind of split from the Department of Posts and became the Department of Telecommunications. But uh, the real seminal moment or the real uh, point of interest as because we are experiencing it now is was in 1991 when there was the introduction of the telecommunications act which repealed this uh, telecommunications ordinance and what happened then was uh, up until then pretty much everything telecoms related happened under the department of telecommunications at that point they split it to create what was known as the office of the director Gen general dg this was a single person, and he was in fact called the authority between inverted commas as well in this act. And uh, the, the department's infrastructure part and all that was transferred to what we now know as uh, Sri Lanka Telecom, uh, with the public uh, infrastructure transferred to them, and they became a public, co they became a public corporation. In 1996, that office of the DG became known as the commission, which is what we now know as the TRCSL, the Telecom mm -hmm. Regulatory Commission of Sri Lanka. At, in 96, it was just five members from one to five, but now it's a proper office which oversees all the governance related to the telecommunications field. And subsequently, in 1996, SLT moved from a public corporation to a public company because uh, the part of it was uh, divested to a foreign in international owner, so there's, it's still a state-owned enterprise, but semi-government. So that 1991 Act, uh, I'm not a lawyer, but I think it's Act number 25, I believe, uh, was certainly an important part in how all this got institutionalized in Sri Lanka. So it's been a very interesting journey of how uh, we start at the Bristol Hotel you mentioned and where we have come to today in terms of actually making it part of legislation, ensuring that it is part and parcel of uh, the legislative framework of this country as to where we have brought it. When we return with the next segment of the Sri Lankan understanding, we're going to look at the mobile revolution that took place and we're going to look at certain personalities who were involved in this sector. Telecommunication and its relevance for Sri Lanka. We're in conversation with Dr. Shamil Lakhdeh. Welcome back to the Sri Lankan Understanding. We're in conversation with Dr. Shamil Appadare and we're looking at social aspects of the telecommunication industry in Sri Lanka. We looked at the past, we looked at where we have come from, what has been the trajectory, the key milestones that we have focused on. But something I'd like to ask you about is 1989, the mobile revolution takes place in Sri Lanka. How does it flow from there? Yeah, I mean, today you can't talk about telecommunications without talking about mobile. So 1989, Sri Lanka had its first mobile operator. It was known as Celtel at that time. It's actually, we were the first in South Asia and I believe Southeast Asia as well. And if I'm correct on Southeast Asia, that means we introduced mobile before the likes of Singapore and places who, you know, everybody tends to think that they were the benchmark. So certainly very, very far thinking, and this was, would have still been just the end days of the Department of Telecommunications. So uh, the people who took that decision were certainly very brave. 
uh, what started then was what, what we now would call 1G, the first generation of mobile communications with Celtel. Uh, we then had uh, Call Link, which is now Hutch, uh, which was formed in 1992, Mobitel in 1993, and they were all 1G, first generation mobile. But I think mobile really took off uh, when Dialog launched uh, GSM, mm -hmm. uh, the 2G technology in 1994, I believe. And that's that was really the, the the killer. From there, it was just exponential growth, and Dialog certainly did the country proud by launching this technology. And I, I mentioned standards before, and one thing that's really important, whoever it was at Dialog took a really good step in going with GSM, because the US, who up until that point were the dominant force in telecoms, they went with a mobile technology called ETEX, but they were the only ones doing it. Whereas GSM was the European standard by the GSMA body. And uh, the fact that Sri Lanka kind of aligned to that. So the Europeans did it because they wanted you to be able to communicate freely wherever you traveled in Europe. And the fact that Sri Lanka also joined that standard made sure that you could use your phone anywhere in the world. So the original 1G phone probably only worked in Sri Lanka. Uh, so aligning, like I said, communications is international, even though we're talking about it in a Sri Lankan context. So it's very important that you align yourself with what's happening with the rest of the world uh, and don't try to do things on your own. So dialogue, certainly, they need a big, a big round of applause for what they did in 1994. So then 2G became popular. Uh, in 2007, uh, we had the launch of 3G. And uh, wh what happens with each generation is actually uh, the fact that new features keep getting added on. Now we talk about 5G and people think, oh, it's just faster internet. That's not the case, really. Every generation brought with it a new feature. So even 1G to 2G, with 2G we got SMS for the first time, which you didn't have in 1G. With 3G, you got internet on the go, so data services. And uh, Dialog and Mobitel kind of, well, Dialog launched first with what was known as R99, but Mobitel launched with a slightly later version, but a more superior version called HSPA. And that's when the internet really took off in Sri Lanka. So in 2007, uh, I don't know, well, it's probably not something to be proud of, but despite our great history in telecoms, we had only 300,000 internet connections in this country uh, through the landlines. Only 300,000. In 2007, with the advent of mobile, everybody started getting on the internet. And as you know, today you can't live without the internet. So that was another important milestone uh, in the mobile revolution. Because in Sri Lanka, even today, mobile is really carrying the burden of internet. Not many people are stuck to their desktops at home using it. They want internet anywhere, everywhere they go. So with that popularity, they found that 3G wasn't really doing the business. So in 2013 or so, uh, all the operators started launching 4G. And that was a mobile service specific for internet, really. So it was designed. So voice was taking less of importance. It's still, everybody still makes voice calls, even though they don't uh, take or they, they you know, they, they kind of take it for granted now. But uh, th now internet seems to be the more popular demand, if you like, on mobile. And mobile is just carrying this country through. You know, even in this pandemic time, everybody is just saying, you know, we don't have coverage here. What that means is they're using mobiles, right, so to get this. So, so certainly we are, we are we're really punching above our weight for a little country like this, because technology is bought from international vendors, so we are paying dollar rates. And uh, we still make this a profitable business. A little anecdote to give you, when uh, 1G, when the first mobile services came in, it was 30 rupees a minute for a voice call. And bread was 3 rupees and 10 cents. Today, bread is 75 rupees for a loaf of bread. And it's uh, 1 rupee per minute for a voice call. I don't think there is any other industry or, or service anywhere, not only in Sri Lanka, but in the world, where pricing and costs have gone contrary to inflation. I mean, one rupee today is not worth as much as one rupee 30 years ago. But we are still able to do that. And, we, and off that one rupee, so much of it goes in taxes and things like that. So uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very dynamic and very uh, 
exciting industry. I'm privileged to be in it. I'm so glad. And Sri Lanka should be really proud of what the operators, all of them do, because this is now the, like the fourth utility. You know, you had electricity, water, maybe gas, and now you can't live without internet connectivity or mobile connectivity. So Absolutely. Nice. And this is all happening within a very short <coughs> span of time. We are seeing this. This is not something that's taking hundreds of years to uh, change. No. It's so rapid. I mean, we, we've seen this in the last 10, 20 years, so much of advancement from what f mobiles were early 1990s, late 1990s, those huge um, brick phones, bricks phones as we used to bricks, call them, yeah. to what it is today. And I'm sure in the next 10, 20 years, we're going to see massive change. And that's what we're going to talk about, as well as pioneers in this field, people who have made a huge contribution to the advancement of telecommunication in Sri Lanka. When we return with the Sri Lankan Understand. Welcome back to the Sri Lankan Understanding. We're in conversation with Dr. Shamila Padurai and we're looking at the social aspects of telecommunication in Sri Lanka. When we look at the pioneers in the field, people who made a huge contribution to this sector, sometimes nationally or also internationally, one person who comes to mind is Sir Arthur C. Clarke. If you reflect on his contribution and that of others in this field, uh, what have they done? How have they been able to impact us? Yeah, Arthur C. Clarke is... We are lucky that he came and resided in Sri Lanka because he, he's not actually a pioneer of telecoms only. I, I think his greater claim to fame would be as the father of space travel and space research. But he was a visionary, so he understood uh, you know, what he imagined people had a tendency to flock to make happen in reality. So uh, one of his uh, great contributions, <laughs> the lines he came up with was, don't commute, communicate. And for the longest time, the mobile, uh, the telcos in the world have been trying to tell people, you know, you can work from home, there's no need to do this. And it never happened until the pandemic. And now when we've been forced into lockdown, people are understanding the value of not uh, commuting, but just doing your communications from home. So he, he certainly brought that vision. And another important thing was he was the one who actually understood the importance of satellite technology. This uh, I mentioned earlier that Sri Lanka had the first uh, satellite earth station in Paduka in 1976. That was his brainchild and vision. Uh, it's because of him that it happened. And in 1955 or so, he actually coined the term. He, he just thought he, he didn't invent satellites or geostationary satellites, but he was the first to understand that they could be used as international relays. So you could talk from one side of the world to the other side of the world via a satellite. And that was his his idea, basically. And so that became true in Sri Lanka. So I think um, wireless has been very, very strong in the latter part of Sri Lanka's history. And that's thanks to Arthur C. Clarke. Uh, but we've had our Sri Lankan heroes as well. Uh, one of them was a gentleman by the name of Vernon Watson. He. Uh, he, he joined uh, the Department of Posts and Telecommunications in 1948. Uh, he had just come back from the UK and studied telecoms, but uh, he, he, he was really working, while working at the Department of Telecoms, uh, Posts and Telecommunications, he actually was lecturing as well, both in uh, Katubadda, the University of Ceylon, uh, in Peradenia, and at Katubadda at the time on a voluntary basis, and t teaching engineers of the future while also doing his day job in this thing. And that had a massive impact because I was told somewhere in 1960, there were only six people doing studying telecoms in uh, Peradenia. And he, he really kick-started that by uh, getting all this done. And in fact, he was the project manager who made that satellite earth station happen. So Arthur C. Clarke's idea was made a reality through Mr. Vernon Watson. Awesome. Uh, and then he subsequently with the Telecommunications Act and the, uh, in 1990, he was the first chairman of Sri Lanka Telecom as well. So he had educated the engineers, he has delivered projects, and certainly in all, the, uh, all of Sri Lanka's history, at some day I think we should look back and call him the father of telecoms probably in Sri Lanka. Uh, the second one uh, would have to be Dr. Hans Vijay Surya. So I mentioned what Dialogue did in 1994. 
and he's been in the industry for 20, 20, 25, close to 30 years now, and you can't have a conversation. I think if we were having this conversation in 100 years' time, Dr. Hans Vujay Surya would have to be mentioned in similar lines to Dr. Mr. Vernon Watson. Yeah. When we look at technology, it tends to concentrate power on a certain group of people. Is this true of Sri Lanka as well? Uh, it, it isn't yet. <laughs> it's not yet, but that's, that's a good question. I mean, you have to be uh, careful uh, in the sense of how you apply these technologies. So the, what's real, this sort of uh, fear has come with what is known as OTT players, over-the-top players. So you know in Sri Lanka, we have these great telecom networks. They are funded by private companies or whatever, and they are not cheap. However, there are what are known, the, these OTT players, over-the-top players, like the likes of Google, Facebook, Netflix. Uh, they have what is known as the content that people want to connect and use. So they don't pay a cent for how all these telecom infrastructure that's happening in this country. So they are making money off Sri Lankans, but they don't pay taxes or anything like that. So that is how there is this sort of fear that power technology can sort of bring, uh, concentrate in one place or the other. But in general, technology is actually quite democratic. And uh, if time permits, uh, there's an interesting story. So when telecommunications first happened, there was, they were manually connected. So when you called it or, or uh, your local exchange, there were ladies who would connect your calls through. And in the US, there was this undertaker by the name of Strouger. And whenever people called and said, could you put me through to the undertaker, uh, he believed that his competing undertaker's wife worked there and she would route all the calls to him, to her, to her husband. So he was really angry about this and he invented what's known as the Strouger switch. So that's when the telecom exchange became automated and those Strouger switch, switches were running until the mid-1980s, uh, so almost 100 years. This was 1878, I think. And uh, so it, it became a way of democratizing everything. So it wasn't, in fact, concentrating power, but actually democratizing. That's really so. good. In terms of going into the future, we've seen this technology revolution taking place. If you could briefly tell us, are there any fears for human race in general, but Sri Lankans in particular? We've got all this new technology coming. <laughs> what do we have to be concerned about? Uh, it, yeah, it's good to be a little bit concerned. I think uh, whatever technology you, you adopt or anyone adopts, they need to do a little bit of research beyond it. We are becoming a bit lazy in that anything new and shiny, we just adopt it and bring it into our lives. So it's good to be a little bit concerned or know what the background is on technology. I think if I can dispel one myth is that lots of, I, I've spoken at a few conferences and one question I keep getting asked is, do telecommunication or mobile base stations cause cancer or something like that? And I have to say, nothing is further from the truth because uh, unlike the pharmaceutical industry, we don't even have a solution if we were to infect you with cancer or something or the other, right? So there are serious standards in place to ensure that this is safe as possible. It is not in our interest to kill off our subscribers. So <laughs> that is one place where I don't think you need to be concerned about. But as technology is evolving to this extent, there are things like artificial intelligence and all, which will, it's not telecoms per se, but it's becoming a big part of telecommunications. Your data privacy, now that telecoms is moving so much to internet-based activity, people give away their private information so freely. And I think you need to be a lot more concerned about what's happening with those sorts of areas. And uh, j just one other point, I mean, the medical profession has always had a medical ethics committee or people studying the ethics around administrating medicine. And I would like to see maybe an ethics committee being evolved for telecommunications going forward. We, we haven't needed it so far, but I, there are certain things that are coming in the future which I think have ethical connotations and it's good if you at least study it and you go in with your eyes wide open rather than just having it forced upon you. So yeah, technology is great and we sh uh, I think you should adopt it, but just be careful. Absolutely, that was a very important point that the ethical understanding of what we're doing. We do it in so many other sectors. We have got to look at it from a much uh, stronger perspective, understanding what it is actually and what it is bringing into our lives. It's bringing a lot of conveniences, 
but let's understand where it's coming from. We need to be much more aware. Thank you very much for taking time to join us and speak to us about this area. When we look at the industry of telecommunication and the social aspects, we see people becoming that much more hooked on to their mobile phones, that much more hooked on to technology in general. It is a huge convenience. It is taking us into the future. It is making a big difference. But we need to also understand from where it's coming. In the past, we had people who were released from prison who had trackers attached to their ankles. Today, our mobile phones are trackers that we voluntarily use or we voluntarily adopt. We've got to be aware, we've got to be concerned uh, about where technology can take us, but it's something that we will have to adopt and is the path to the future. Thank you very much for joining us on the Sri Lankan Understanding. Our topic today was the social aspects of telecommunication in Sri Lanka, and we had Dr. Shamil Lapadore. Thank you so much once again for joining us and uh, discussing this area with us. Join us again next time when we focus on another aspect or critical concern to our country. We look at the trajectory this country has taken from the past into the present and the potential and opportunities as we go into the future. Thank you.